Good morning. It's great to see everyone today and to present to you on how we're curbing this pandemic, where we stand now, where we hope to be in the coming weeks, and when we may see the return to normalcy. So let's start with the first slide. So in a world when you can be anything, be a COVID researcher. That is what Dr. Pahoot's gonna share with us today. And I'll set up the um, in initial information about where we stand with COVID, next slide. So to let you know, there are many viruses that are respiratory viruses, just as SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory virus. But most of our viruses are simple viruses, adenovirus, influenza, parainfluenza, rhinoviruses, respiratory syncytial virus, enteroviruses, and even human coronaviruses. There are three major common coronaviruses that produce respiratory infection in children and adults. The respiratory infections they produce is generally the common cold and not what we see with the more serious coronaviruses that have evolved from animals. These include SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, and what we're talking about today, SARS-CoV-2, the virus causing COVID-19. Next slide. So the Chinese authorities reported the first coronavirus case that we now know is SARS-CoV-2 on December 31st and linked it to a seafood and animal market in Wuhan in the Hebei province. The first patient in the United States was from the state of Washington and reported on January 20th, 2020. It was not until months later that the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And at that point, there were 118,000 cases of this illness in over 110 countries and territories around the world with sustained risk of further global spread. On this slide, you see a visual diagram of the 20th deadliest pandemics the world has ever seen. This includes the Black Death or the bubonic plague that killed over 200 million individuals, including a significant portion of the European population. You notice we have smallpox and Spanish flu. So Spanish flu is the first influenza pandemic that we saw around the world. As you look further, pandemics that you likely recognize include the HIV or AIDS pandemic. And then in the purple box square is COVID-19. Next slide. Globally, thus far, COVID-19 has been associated with 50 million cases and 1.2 million deaths. In the United States, this includes over 10 million cases and 241,000 deaths. And in Missouri, 229,000 plus cases and 3411 deaths. If you look at this photo of the United States that describes average daily cases as of today, what you will note is that the Midwest is the epicenter for disease. On the right-hand portion of this slide, what you'll notice is a slide uh, of a picture of the state of Missouri. The red hotspot counties you notice from just one week ago look predominantly to be in the central part of our state and the southeast part of our state. Fast forward to today and what you notice is our entire state is hot. We are at an uptick in diseases that threaten to overwhelm our healthcare system. Next slide. What are we seeing? Well, we're seeing 
disease, this respiratory infection that produces pneumonia and a cytokine storm syndrome that includes rates of hospitalization that increase with age and increase with certain underlying conditions, including heart failure and coronary artery disease, hypertension, active cancers, solid organ transplants, neuromuscular diseases, chronic lung diseases, type 2 diabetes, severe obesity, and chronic kidney disease. We have limited treatment for these uh, patients, and while they include oxygen and ventilation and dexamethasone, the most recent data on remdesivir is not that it's going to shorten the course of disease or limit death. And for convalescent plasma, similarly, questions about its effectiveness. Monoclonal antibodies do appear to be effective, but not for people with advanced disease. It appears they're going to be most effective for people who are mildly ill at the beginning of their disease. Next slide. As we look at age-adjusted COVID-19 hospitalization rates, what we see is not only that age and underlying conditions are related to who will be hospitalized, but there have been a disproportionate impact on Hispanic and Latinos, non-Hispanic Blacks, and non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Natives. And what you see is not only a higher risk that they will be hospitalized, but a higher risk of death in these uh, racial and ethnic groups. Next slide. There's also been an increased risk for ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and death in pregnant women. And this data is unpublished data from the CDC, but I'd like for you to look at both pregnant women and non-pregnant women that have been evaluated in terms of how many with COVID have required ICU admissions, mechanical ventilations, ECMO, a very advanced heart-lung machine that is basically the, the last ditch effort in supporting individuals and death. And what you see here, and these are risks um, of each of these factors, and you see that women who are pregnant are more than two times more likely to be in an ICU, to require mechanical ventilation, to require ECMO, and have an increased likelihood of dying from COVID. Next slide. So in terms of children and COVID, what we know are children are less likely to be infected if they're exposed, less likely to be symptomatic, less likely to get severely ill, and less likely to infect others, particularly the younger patients. What we've seen though is an increase in the number of cases in children with a 17% increase nationally in the last two weeks. Nationally, kids who are 22% of the population represent 11% of cases and 1% of hospitalizations. There have been roughly 100 deaths, but there has been an increased risk, just like we've seen these racial and ethnic disparities in adults who've been hospitalized and died. We see an increased risk for children who are Hispanic, Black, or Native American to be hospitalized. And while children have not uh, died at a high rate at the rates we've seen in the adult population, we do have a risk of this late stage complication of COVID-19, which is termed multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And in this particular case, the most severely of these children who present two to four weeks after they've had COVID infection is that they present with severe manifestations that involve multiple different systems, but particularly the cardiovascular system. And in terms of total cases, uh, this is from the end of October, over a thousand of these cases and deaths within this population. And again, a disproportionate impact on Hispanic, non-Hispanic Black and uh, populations and uh, across the United States and here locally at Children's Mercy. Next slide. So one piece of good news, schools are safe and masks work. So the mitigation strategies that have just been announced by the governor's office and embraced uh, by our public health authorities is how we can more effectively keep kids in school. Everyone masked, and if one person, say a teacher becomes ill, 
isolating the teacher. But if all the kids were in masks, they are not quarantined, they are self-monitoring. In contrast, if a child is infected and close contacts are uh, around that child, again, no quarantine. If the child is unmasked and close contacts are unmasked, isolating the sick patient and quarantining the rest of the class is what happens. Next slide. So the vaccines that we're praying for for COVID will be among the greatest of health achievements uh, as they've been in the last century. There are 17 preventable diseases by vaccines. Two vaccines prevent cancer, hepatitis B vaccine and HPV vaccine. And one appears to reduce the chance a child will develop type one diabetes, and this is rotavirus vaccine. If we compare 20th century annual morbidity and current estimates for vaccine preventable diseases, what we see is impressive reductions in cases of diphtheria, measles, mumps, pertussis, polio, rubella, congenital rubella, tetanus, hemophilus influenzae, which is a meningitis bacteria, and eradication of smallpox. Next slide. So there's been rapid development of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. More than 180 vaccines are in clinical trials. More than 100 companies have been engaged. And the US government has taken the risk out of vaccine development for pharma by paying for the many of these phase three trials and for the mass production of these vaccines. Most of the vaccines, as you'll hear Dr. Perhud describe, are against forming antibodies against the spike protein off on the COVID virus. And this spike protein is what is required for the virus to enter cells. Next slide. So the way we develop vaccines is to go from a phase two, one, two to a phase three trial. We're currently in these phase three trials. The phase one trials generally include 20 to 100 health, uh, healthy volunteers. And we're looking to see, do they work? And are there any serious effects? Phase two, we get several hundred uh, individuals involved. And we look at short-term side effects and are they responding? Is their immune system making antibodies? And these phase three trials we're on now are generally 30,000 or more. That's a pretty average number. And that's what most of the trials have had. And you have individuals who get vaccine and individuals who don't in order to study safety, effectiveness, and outlining common side effects. Then the FDA gets involved and license vaccines only if the, they are safe and effective and the benefits outweigh risks. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pahu to tell you about COVID vaccine trials and how close we are to having an end to this pandemic. Dr. Pahu. Hello, everybody. Let's talk about vaccines. Are we gonna have the first slide? Next slide, please. Okay. So I just want to remind everybody that this is not the first time that we have had a pandemic of this magnitude. People, uh, our grandparents, remember the time when we had polio, when people would be afraid of going out and swimming in public uh, pools. And you can see here on the graph that I have on the left, how the impact of introducing a vaccine into the public health helped curb this disease tremendously. Back then we had impact of polio acutely, as you can see with the iron lungs that were in hospitals. But we also know that there were long-term consequences of polio with people that lived with disabilities after the fact. Next slide. As you can see here, we're having uh, babies that would be impacted by the disease and long-term survivors that struggled with polio. And this is the problem that we're gonna face with COVID as well if we don't act promptly to try to curb this disease. 
So in case you live under a rock, I just wanted to bring you up to speed very quickly. We have this pandemic going on in the world. And just to get us all on the same terminology, severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus that causes the disease versus COVID-19 is the name of the disease that SARS-CoV-2 causes. As you know, we first detected this virus in the world in China sometime around November, December. By January of 2020, we were already working on uh, the genome of this virus to be able to start working on a vaccine. By the end of January, the outbreak was declared a public health emergency. By February, the disease that's caused by SARS-CoV-2 was named COVID-19. And by March, the WHO declared a COVID-19 pandemic. And this was the first time that a coronavirus had ever caused a pandemic in the world. We had had, as Marianne just uh, suggested, Dean Jackson, many other diseases cause pandemics around the world, but this is the first time we've ever had a coronavirus do this. And also in March, we started the first human clinical trials for vaccines. So as you can see, there's a lot of people that believe we don't need a vaccine and they want to use unproven methods such as chloroquine. I'm gonna be on the other side of the equation. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the science and what we're doing to bring vaccines and to be able to get back to normal. The first thing I wanna say is what is COVPN? The COVPN is uh, the COVID-19 Prevention Network. It was formed by the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases to respond to the global pandemic. And basically, it's, uh, their mission is to conduct phase three efficacy vaccine trials to prevent COVID-19 infection and disease. The network anticipated to open four phase three placebo controlled clinical trials when we started, each of them enrolling about 30,000 patients. But in some cases, we may be doing more work than originally anticipated. So how did we get involved with the COVID-19 Prevention Network? Well, Children's Mercy is a member of the IMPACT Network where we do a lot of vaccine clinical trials. And we were a member of the VTU, the Vaccine and Treatment Evaluation Unit. So we have a proven record of knowing how to do vaccine clinical trials with the NIH. And the COVID-19 Prevention Network basically reached out to all the networks that have experience conducting clinical trials with vaccines, and that's how the network was created. Because we are a pediatric hospital, however, as you know, most of these vaccine studies originally are targeting adults. So we decided to partner with our colleagues at KU Frontiers to be able to bring to Kansas City the first adult COVID-19 clinical trial to bring a vaccine to our city and our state. The first thing I want to clarify is what we are doing is studying a vaccine. This is not us rolling out a vaccine to protect the public yet. We are still in the phases where we're trying to evaluate if the vaccine works. So the study vaccine is experimental as of right now. That means we still don't know 100% if it's going to be effective to use in people in either preventing disease or reducing the severity of infection. And a study vaccine can only be used in research. So this is alluding to what Dr. Jackson was talking about. On your left, you can see the coronavirus virus and you can see the spike protein that gives it its crown-like appearance. That little spike protein right there is what attaches to the human ACE2 receptor on the right. So it's basically like a key and a doorknob. And the way that I like to explain this uh, in simple terms, especially to children is the coronavirus needs to shake hands with a human cell for them to recognize each other and for the virus to infect humans. So this is basically what happened. There it is, the crown spike protein reaching out to the ACE2 receptor in the human cell. And once they make contact, then the coronavirus can invade the human cell. That is why we are targeting the crown spike protein in the vaccine, because if you remove that key or if you remove that handshaking event, then the virus cannot infect the human cell. So this is the target of the vaccine, creating antibodies that you can see here in purple and in green. They attack the crown, and then by attacking this spike protein, there can be no fusion of the virus with the human cell and thus no infection. This is some of the vaccines that are currently being studied as part of Operation Warp Speed. 
And there is one vaccine here uh, that you have heard about also in the news, the Pfizer vaccine. It's not being studied through Operation Warp Seed or the COVID-PN, but there's basically three platforms. Nucleic acid platforms that I will describe in a second. Basically what you have heard in the news as messenger RNA. Those two vaccines are the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. We have viral vector vaccines, such as the Oxford or AstraZeneca vaccine, the Janssen vaccine and the Merck vaccine and protein subunit vaccines like the Novavax and Sanofi. I will describe all of these platforms in more detail in the following slides. If you ever want to know which vaccines are currently out there, all you need to do is Google WHO and COVID-19 vaccines and you will come to this page. If you click on the button that says download, you will download a long document that looks sort of like this. And in that document, you can see all the way to your left, the name of the vaccines, and then, as you can see in that table, which platform, what's their name, and all the way to the right, which phases of clinical trials they're currently at. So if you are interested in reviewing the data and understanding what kind of studies are being done, it's all available to the public. Now, if you want to find an easier way to understand this, instead of going to the WHO, I would highlight the New York Times uh, coronavirus vaccine tracker. This is one of my favorite resources that I follow since the pandemic started. All you need to do again is Google New York Times coronavirus vaccine tracker and you will find this information. So notice how I put two different data here, one from August 31st and another one from November 10th. Notice how this New York Times article continuously updates the information that we have about the vaccines in production. So you can see that in August 31st, we had 23 vaccines in phase one, while on November 10th, we're already up to 38. Back in August 31st, we had nine vaccines in phase three, and now we have 11. So this is a great way, and it's very easily written and easy to digest for you to stay um, current as to what's happening in the vaccine world. With all the vaccines, the main goal, as you can see on the right, is we have the virus. The spike protein here is uh, depicted in red. And our goal with the vaccine is to produce those antibodies highlighted in green here that will attach to that spike protein like I described earlier. So I'm going to try to explain in brief how all these vaccines are made. We have genetic vaccines and basically all of us humans as well as viruses, we are um, produced based on a genetic code. The coronavirus vaccine is basically a little piece of the genetic material that codes for the spike protein. So if it takes 30,000 genetic material to create a whole coronavirus, what we're doing is just grabbing a little piece of that uh, genome and only the piece that creates the spike protein of the coronavirus, and that is what we're gonna inject into you so that you can create that spike protein yourself and produce antibodies against it. So I'm going to try to explain it in a uh, more graphical way here. You have that messenger RNA, basically the letters that code for that spike protein in the coronavirus. We grab that tiny piece of information and we put it inside of a lipid nanoparticle and that's what gets injected into your arm. Then your cells will grab that nanoparticle and it gets introduced into the cell. Your human cell will then read that messenger RNA and produce the spike protein in your own cell. And then your body will learn to recognize that spike protein as a part of the virus and create immunity against it so that when you encounter the virus, you will be protected. Then uh, the best example of these genetic vaccines are the Moderna vaccine that you have heard about a lot in the news. They've already completed enrolling 30,000 participants in their studies, and they're moving on soon to pediatric clinical trials. The other vaccine that you might want to know about in this uh, forum is Pfizer. As you know, they already displayed information this past Monday showing that their vaccine was about 90% effective at preventing disease. This is great news in the vaccine world. We were not sure if a coronavirus vaccine was gonna be as effective as the influenza vaccine, or if it was gonna be more like childhood vaccines that are very effective. Based on this preliminary data, it looks like the messenger RNA technology used by Pfizer and Moderna and other vaccines 
will be effective at preventing disease with uh, our current vaccination efforts. The next type of vaccines are viral vector vaccines. They use the same technology that Pfizer and Moderna use, the messenger RNA. What changes is that instead of these uh, vaccine pieces being delivered through a nanoparticle, they're being delivered inside of an empty virus shell. So there are viruses that cause infections in humans like adenovirus, they cause a common cold. What we do is we empty that content of the virus and we only use the envelope of the virus. It's like a box and we just put the genetic information inside and that's what gets injected into you. So I'm sure you all have heard that the Chinese started immunizing their population already with a vaccine. This is a vaccine they're using, a viral vector vaccine. What they did, however, is they skipped the phase three stage of investigation and just started giving the vaccine to the public. It's the same situation that happened in Russia. The Russians also started giving this same type of vaccine and they're doing it without doing a phase three study like we are in the United States. What we are doing in the United States is we're also using this technology and this is the vaccine that we're actually currently testing here at Children's Mercy in conjunction with KU Medical Center. The vaccine was developed at Oxford University and so you have heard of it as the Oxford vaccine, but they collaborated with AstraZeneca to be able to increase uh, research studies across the world and production. So you've also heard of it as the AstraZeneca vaccine. And finally, protein-based vaccines are the traditional vaccines that we are more comfortable dealing with. Uh, they're like the childhood vaccines that we know and understand. The protein, the spike protein itself is produced and that's what's injected into your arm. As opposed to the messenger RNAs vaccines where we're not giving you the protein itself, we're giving you the recipe so that your own body will produce that protein. So these protein-based vaccines in, are um, included, uh, for example, Novavax will be doing this type of delivery process and Sanofi will also be using this type of technology. And one of these slides went by a little bit too quickly. So let me go back to explain the protein. Basically we have, as you can see here, the long strand of the virus DNA, the, what creates the virus. And you can see that the only piece that we need is the one that creates the spike protein. So we just cut that little piece of information, the messenger RNA, and, and that will then produce a protein. And the protein is what's injected into the humans with protein vaccines. The messenger RNA is what's injected into humans with messenger RNA vaccines. And then we also have whole virus vaccines that we are not currently using in the United States. The entire coronavirus virus is inactivated or it's attenuated like we do with measles, mumps, rubella vaccines, and it's injected into humans so that you will learn to recognize the virus and create an immune response. We are not currently doing this in the United States. So I'm going to highlight now more the vaccine that we are currently testing here in Kansas City. Uh, this is the Oxford or AstraZeneca vaccine. And in the scientific world, we know this as a Chaddox vaccine. It's called Chaddox vaccine because as you can see, Chaddox stands for chimpanzee adenovirus Oxford vaccine. The virus that is being used to deliver the messenger RNA is a chimpanzee adenovirus. The reason why we're using a chimpanzee adenovirus is in the past, we have used human adenoviruses to deliver uh, information in a similar manner. And we noticed that a lot of humans already have had infections with adenovirus. Adenovirus is a virus that causes the common cold, for example. And so if you've already been infected with that virus, the vaccine may not work because you've already seen that virus. So the company decided to do a smart switch and instead of using human adenovirus, they're using chimpanzee adenovirus because it's very similar. It produces a great immune response, but it's more likely to work since we have not been exposed to chimpanzee adenoviruses. The adenovirus, like I said, is not an active virus. Basically, the entire contents of the virus are emptied and we're only using the shell. And then we insert a copy of the spike protein found on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2, like I explained earlier. This is a visual representation of what that vaccine looks like. You can see on the top left a chimpanzee adenovirus fully active. 
we modify it, empty the contents, and make that virus capsule basically inactive. It cannot reproduce, it cannot cause infection, it's only the shell basically, like an empty box. Then we have the SARS-CoV-2 virus on your right. We grab the messenger RNA, basically the recipe to make a virus, and we cut only the pieces that we need to make only the spike protein. That gene sequence is inserted inside of that Chadox viral vector, the chimpanzee adenovirus empty shell. And that is your vaccines. That's the Chadox vaccine. We inject that into the human. Then the human will produce the spike protein inside of our own cells. Your body will create antibodies against it. And that's how you get protection so that when you get exposed to the virus, your antibodies will protect you and prevent infection. So the main research questions are, is the study vaccine safe to give to people? That's what we're looking for when we're doing these studies. Can the study vaccine reduce the severity of COVID-19 illness? Or can the study prevent infection altogether? So in this first stage of the vaccine, uh, the search for a vaccine, we're only enrolling adults. And basically any adult that is at risk of SARS-CoV-2 is somebody that we're interested in enrolling. Any adult over the age of 65 is high risk, people with underlying health conditions, people that have a greater chance of exposure due to their job, like healthcare workers, or people that work in grocery stores, uh, first line um, health officials, or for example, police officers, firemen, people who live or work in elder care facilities, people who work in jails or prisons, and uh, people from diverse backgrounds like African-American or Latinx populations, as Dr. Jackson highlighted, at our increased risk of severe COVID disease, hospitalization, or death. And again, this is a slide highlighting what Dr. Jackson pointed out. Here's the age-adjusted COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity, and you can see that Hispanic, Latino, American Indian and black non-Hispanic by far outweigh the number of hospitalizations compared to white non-Hispanic. For that reason, our outreach uh, efforts and doing this study in the Kansas City area has been to execute the study at the main campus in KU Medical Center at our Rainbow and Fairway facilities, as well as Wichita. But we're also trying to enroll participants in satellite sites to be able to reach underserved populations and populations that are high risk of infection. For example, our mobile unit is currently parked outside of Truman Medical Center Lakewood, and we are enrolling patients from their uh, long uh, term, long hair, their facility that has um, elderly people living there. We are also going to health partnerships uh, facility that sees primarily Latinx population. And the mobile unit will be traveling to Wichita to enroll participants at Dold Foods and Hunter Health. This is a slide just to show you the target number of primary endpoint events that we need to be able to find out if the vaccine works. And you can see that if for the Moderna study, for example, we needed a number of 151 cases of uh, disease to be able to see if the vaccine works. What we expected if the vaccine was 60% effective would be 107 cases among those that received the placebo versus 44 cases among those that received the vaccine. Given the data that was recently published this week, well presented, not published by Pfizer, it is likely that we'll see higher protection with this vaccine. So that 60% vaccine effectiveness may be higher, which means we may be seeing more cases among the placebo group than the uh, group that received the vaccine. And you can see that down the line, AstraZeneca, same thing, we expected 82 among placebo, 68 among the vaccine recipients. And the reason why those numbers change is each study is designed slightly different. In the Moderna study, we were enrolling 50% of cases would get the vaccine, 50% of cases would get the saline or placebo. Versus in the AstraZeneca study, you have two out of three chances of getting the vaccine versus one out of three chances of getting the placebo. One of the most frequent questions I've received is, is it possible to get COVID-19 disease through the vaccine? And hopefully after you've heard how this vaccine is uh, produced and created, you will understand that it's impossible to get disease from this vaccine because we are not giving you the virus. We are giving you only a piece of 
genetic material that will create the spike protein. The spike protein alone cannot cause disease. The spike protein is just the key that lets you inside of the human cell to cause infection. So it's impossible for the vaccines that are currently being used in the United States to cause or to get COVID-19 disease from the vaccine. What is possible is that you get vaccinated and you get the disease or that you get the placebo and you get the disease because you live in planet Earth and you're still exposed. But it is not possible for you to get the vaccine and get the disease because of the vaccine. Part of the issues that we have as we move into clinical trials is that we need to be very careful monitoring the safety of vaccines and seeing how reactogenic the vaccines are. What that means is how many side effects does the vaccine cause when we give them to you? Does it give fever? Does it cause pain? Is it a vaccine that the public will tolerate? So that adverse reaction that you feel when you get a vaccine and you feel chills or headache is basically your immune system responding to the vaccine. So in creating and in finding an, a vaccine that the public will tolerate, we need to do what we call the Goldilocks of an immune response. If it's too little, it won't protect you. If it's too high, it will protect you, but the public may not want to get a vaccine that causes too much pain or fever. So we need to find the vaccine that has just right immune protection. Usually we need boosting doses in order to achieve protection. Five out of the six vaccines that are currently being studied need two doses as opposed to one. And we have to be very careful with evaluating safety versus speed. We want to be safe before we are speedy. We will move as fast as we can, but not if that compromises safety. I wanted to discuss uh, before finishing EUA or the emergency use authorization. Pfizer, as you know, presented results of 90% uh, effectiveness in their vaccine earlier this week. And they, it is expected that they will be requesting emergency use authorization in the next uh, 14 days. If the vaccine gets that, user, that authorization, Dr. Fauci has said that by the time we get into December, we will be able to have doses available for people who are judged to be at higher priority to get it first. What that means is we don't have enough vaccine production to be able to immunize the entire country. Only a certain amount of vaccine doses will be available and they will be prioritized for people at high risk very likely that will be healthcare workers first to be able to continue to protect the American public and take care of them as the disease hits our community hard throughout the winter. And then as more vaccine is produced, it'll start being rolled out probably to other high risk populations. And just to remind you, uh, there's been a lot of outbreaks of COVID and transmission in places where we feel like we are safe. For example, among hospital employees, there's been uh, hospital outbreaks of COVID that have been traced back to the break room. So we are seeing patients with coronavirus disease. We are not contacting them from them. We are giving it to each other when we're taking a break. So I want to remind you all to be mindful, to keep your guard up, to wear your face masks. And even when you think that you are safe by hanging out with your friends who you think are part of your own cluster, they each have their own cluster and their own clusters has their own cluster. So by you exposing yourself to them, you're really having exposure to a whole bunch of people. And as the winter comes, I urge you to be careful and to try to keep community spread uh, at bay. In brief, we're probably gonna need two doses before we're able to reach the good immunity among the population. Maybe we should have a little bit more tolerance for a more reactogenic vaccine that protects us for a longer time but I understand that there may be a problem with the public accepting a vaccine that may cause some uh, side effects such as pain or fever. But if the vaccine protects you, I think we should be willing to tolerate some side effects from the vaccine if that means we can get back to normal. We have to urge patients as we do the clinical trials to ensure that the vaccine is safe. I know that we have a pandemic warp speed team, but the immune system will not listen to that. Immune system takes two to three weeks to create immune response, and then we need to boost it. And basically the immune response is similar to wine and cheese. Aging equals a better immune response. And finally, if you want to help us all get back to normal, there is something you can do, and that is volunteer to participate in the vaccine clinical trials. I urge you all to Google the CoVPN network you can volunteer there directly to be a participant of any of the COVPN studies that are happening. 
If you want to volunteer locally, we are pretty full and uh, at capacity with our study, but you can call 913-574-3006 to see if there's still some spots available for you to volunteer. And now I'll give it back to Nancy or Dr. Jackson. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Pahood. You've given uh, all of us a lot to think about. Um, so without further ado, we wanna jump into some of the questions that, be, had, that have been sent to us by those viewing today's edition of TMC Talks. One of them um, is for you, Dr. Pahood, and follows up on something you were just talking about and that is this, um, given that the Pfizer vaccine has been reported to have 90% efficacy and the FDA EUA may be imminent, do you have concerns that once that is granted, it will be more difficult to recruit people into other ongoing vaccine trials? Absolutely, whoever asked this question is clearly paying attention. That is a big concern, not only of mine, but of the COVPN, we are aware that we are trying to get us all back to normal as quickly as possible. In order to do that, we need to be able to have adequate safety data from these clinical trials. For us to be able to do that, we need to finish the clinical trials. So the problem that we're facing is we're trying to recruit participants that are high risk into these clinical trials. But then when the vaccine becomes available, we want to give them the vaccine as quickly as possible, which is basically like shooting ourselves in the foot. So we need to find a balance and try to figure out how we're going to be able to achieve this because obviously it's a priority to continue to monitor the safety of the vaccines at the same time that it's a priority for us to release the vaccine to the public. This question is from uh, Channel 9. Um, Emily Welsh, she asks, will the doctors expand on the fact that six vaccines are approved for early or limited use? Uh, what does that mean? And when can they be in use? And then who would get them? Uh, who would like to answer that one? So I'll start with this and then I'll have Dr. Pahood follow up. One of the points that I wanna make is that at this point in the pandemic, we are at a critical stance our ICUs are full. We have limited beds, we have limited PPE, and we have limitations on healthcare providers who can care for the patients. Even with the good news from Pfizer, we have some gaps in our knowledge. And even once an EUA, EUA is approved, and we have their release of say 30 million doses, which would only cover 15 million people, we have the next six weeks to deal with. And it is our critical responsibility to mask, to socially distance, and to not put ourselves in places where we will be exposed to disease and potentially spread disease within our community. It is critical at this point. The best we can say is even if Pfizer's vaccine comes out and is approved by the beginning of December, it will take 28 days from receipt of that first dose to receive the second dose and then to achieve protection. So while help is on the way, it is literally likely at least two months off and while we expect to see a vaccine EUA approved and then perhaps another one and then perhaps another one, it is likely going to be spring of 2021 before we will have any semblance <clears throat> of vaccine immunity. So we are, I would say we are in dire straits at this point. And the public needs to know that while we are encouraged by the news of the Pfizer vaccine's uh, effectiveness, there is a lot we don't know and scientific analysis has not been complete or transparently shared yet. Uh, and we know that the number of people who have been in the trials allows us to say this vaccine is safe without serious events in essentially 30,000 people. But if there's a one in a million um, we won't have that um, data yet. So we are encouraged, but the steps that we need to take now are the steps that are tried and true, and that is masking, 
social distancing and not placing ourselves, even as healthcare workers, into positions where we could contract a disease. Uh, Dr. Pehud, what is what are your uh, is your viewpoint on when we will get to the point where we will have more than one vaccine and where we will have uh, a vaccine that is accepted? We always say in the vaccine world, vaccines don't save lives. Vaccination saves lives. And so we need to have a significant portion of our population who will accept vaccine. Dr. Pehud? Thank you. So uh, Dr. Jackson highlighted, basically, clearly she trained me because she said a lot of the things that I would have said. Um, here are my fears. Uh, like Dr. Jackson said, even if we get some vaccines, and I want to remind everybody when and if the Pfizer vaccine uh, gets rolled out, probably by the end of December or January, like Dr. Fauci said, there's gonna be a limited number of doses. Those doses are not gonna reach the entire United States. It's only for a very small subset of the population, likely healthcare workers. And I am almost willing to bet that it won't even be enough to cover all healthcare workers in the United States. So a vaccine being available doesn't mean you can go to CVS or Walgreens and get it. That is not the message that people should be hearing. That's what they wanna hear, but that's not what the government or the healthcare um, researchers are telling you. There's gonna be a limited number production. We can't do these vaccines that fast. Number two, when other vaccines continue to be rolled out and slowly more and more vaccines become available, like Dr. Jackson said, it takes getting to a place to get the vaccine, a month later to get boosted, and then two weeks later for your immunity to be ready. So we're talking about at least two months like I said, aging like wine and cheese takes time, minimum two months from the time that you have a vaccine available for you to go get it, get boosted, and then be protected. Third, even after we have all these vaccines ready to go, let's pretend, which is not gonna happen, but let's pretend we're optimistic. And by spring, everybody has availability for a vaccine, which again, I do not believe that will be the case. 50% of Americans don't trust in this vaccine and would not be willing to take it. So I want to remind you that even when we have a vaccine, we're still gonna live in a world where half of the country doesn't want to take this vaccine. Thus, we will not be able to get back to normal yet. Just to amplify one of Dr. Pahood's point and to add another piece of potential fuel to the fire, we're fearful that we'll have the double whammy of influenza and COVID-19 over the coming weeks to months. Influenza comes every year. It is inevitable. It generally comes somewhere between November uh, and December with its onset. And what we know is that Iowa and Indiana are already uh, reporting influenza cases. And once we see two states reporting cases, it's likely we'll see spread and transmission around the country. So consider the dire straits we're in with COVID and then add influenza. In terms of influenza, we have plentiful testing, we have antivirals, and we have an effective vaccine. So it underscores the importance of everyone, not just 50% of the population, but everyone who's six months of age or older, no exceptions except for very rare instances, to receive influenza vaccine at this point. It is here and it is available. And that is one additional measure in, in addition to our masking and distancing that may curb what is happening in our community ahead of having our vaccines. And if I can add to that, Dr. Jackson, um, in this past year, we've been uh, learning from our Southern hemisphere and in some other countries, where they have been better than the United States at uh, doing social distancing, wearing masks, they noticed that the influenza uh, spike that they expected didn't happen. But that is in countries where they were doing everything as we would. Let's be honest and real, and I think we all can agree here that the United States is not doing that. So even though you will hear potentially in the news that influenza may be lower this year because we're all taking care of ourselves, that is happening in other countries, not the United States. 
So I do think we're going to see lower rates of influenza because we are doing better than we did last year, protecting each other with masks and things because last year we didn't have coronavirus disease, but I still think we're not doing enough. So we will see influenza disease. Uh, it will be here. Getting the vaccine will help. But remember, we've had influenza vaccine for years and our coverage is about 50%. So if that's what happens with the coronavirus vaccine, again, hang on tight because winter is coming and it's gonna be a very rough winter. So Dr. Pahood, I think you spoke to this one a little bit. A question that we got asks, uh, what are researchers doing to find a diverse group of participants willing to be a part of the vaccine trial? And then a second part of it, are there specific challenges and barriers when it comes to encouraging diverse populations to get the vaccine? And what, do you, what is being done about that? We are uh, doing something that we've actually never done here before, which is when we do vaccine clinical trials, we try to keep everything uh, very contained within the walls of our ivory tower, like we call it, our academic medical centers, our clinical research units, because we can control everything that happens there. This is unprecedented times. And so what we're doing now is we're bringing the clinical trial to you. We have uh, partnered with the NIH and we're working with mobile units where basically we have converted uh, certain buses and trucks and trailers into research facilities and we're driving them out into the community so that we can come to you and immunize you there as opposed to waiting for you to come to us. There are natural barriers to participants like Latinx communities fear walking into KU Med and enrolling into clinical trial because the truth is they're concerned that somebody may deport them back to their home countries. And we want to make sure the participants feel safe. Uh, there's also a lot of distress from the African-American community given our history with uh, research and we want to be very transparent. So we know that uh, bad things have happened in the past, but moving forward, we're trying to be honest, transparent, and accessible. And that's how we can hopefully enroll more participants that need to be included in these clinical trials. Vaccine disparities, though, have occurred across time. And the National Vaccine Advisory Committee is developing a national plan to address disparities. And disparities have to do with not only access, affordability, uh, and uh, tolerability, but in confidence in the vaccine system. And what we can say and what we need to say is that vaccines uh, have always been among the safest of any preventative or treatment uh, that we've had offered to patients. The systems that we use involve the phase one, two, three trials that you've heard about today, but also post-marketing uh, systems, and there are three of them in the United States, that actually monitor and assure safety. And so I think that's, that's important, uh, that we address these disparities and that these disparities that are addressed come in the very form of enrollment in studies, but also in encouraging diverse populations to accept vaccines. Another question, this is a little broader, um, says with all of the misinformation out there regarding COVID-19, how do you get past that to get people the information they need to gain confidence to get vaccinated? Um, I, I know on a recent late night show, somebody said, uh, I'll get the vaccine when Fauci tells me it's okay. <laughs> so what, what's, the one, what's the one message that you think will get through to people to give them that confidence? Um, I think that uh, we can't tell people right now to get the vaccine yet because it's not approved yet, right? If the Pfizer vaccine becomes available through emergency use, we can then provide data once we see the data published. So far, all we know is a news uh, event that explained that the vaccine is effective, but until this data is published and peer reviewed, all we can say is this is still a study vaccine. Our job as healthcare professionals is to continue to be 
transparent with the public and let you know if there's information you need to know. If we think it's safe for you to get the vaccine, we will tell you to do so. And I agree that if Dr. Fauci says it's uh, okay, obviously we all put our trust in him. He's seen us through many pandemics in this country, including HIV, H1N1, and now this one, there's no reason to believe he wouldn't guide us in the right direction. And I just want to say one more thing before we leave. I know this talk is all about coronavirus, but it is important to highlight that, for example, measles, measles deaths have soared worldwide in the last year, 50% more cases last year alone in the world compared to a year ago because of lack of vaccination coverage. So not only am I worried about coronavirus disease and the impact it's having, I'm worried about other vaccine preventable diseases making a resurgence because we are failing to immunize children. So I would just like to leave with that. We have safe vaccines for other diseases. Please make sure that all children are currently vaccinated. Those are some good last words. Dean Jackson, is there anything else that you'd like us to end on? One of the things we know is that vaccine confidence in the childhood immunization platform is very high. In terms of individuals who reject science and refuse vaccine, it's a small part of the population, but very vocal, and it's in the range of two to three percent. The individuals who accept vaccine are the vast majority. For instance, 92 percent plus of children are immunized uh, with the, the current recommended vaccine uh, platform. There is a group in between that are hesitant. And for those individuals who are vaccine hesitant, in order to generate confidence, we have to understand what their fear is. We have to address it with the science. We have to explain that we as healthcare workers em embrace vaccine, that we, our families, and, uh, are immunized against uh, the vaccine preventable diseases that are out there. And I think that can change the metric and that's gonna be important to leverage as COVID vaccines uh, uh, make their way to the market. Well, thank you both. Thank you doctors with that. We hope this has been, as we say, um, enlightening and thought provoking for everyone involved. You know, as an academic medical center, we at TMC UH believe it is part of our mission to share what we know with others and so it's our hope that with the help of these two incredible experts who've been with us today, the, the brightest minds, we, we like to call them, uh, that we met that mark. So as a reminder, this is the first of a four part series. Coming up, we'll be talking about health equity in the age of COVID. We'll be getting the latest from the CEO of the Missouri Hospital Association. And finally ask the question, what happens if everything really doesn't return to normal? So that's all the time we have for now. Thanks for joining us and TMC Talks. We hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.